Welcome back to Tea with Tolkien, an online community for the Hobbit at Heart. We are inspired by the works, life, and Catholic faith of J.R.R. Tolkien, and strive to encourage others towards a deeper love and understanding of Tolkien's Legendarium by hosting a free book club, providing free resources such as our Silmarillion Reader's Guide, and by cultivating a vibrant and positive community online. Our book club is currently reading through The Fall of Numenor, edited by Brian Sibley. If you would like to join in on the discussion, you can sign up for our free book club at teawithtolkien.com slash book dash club to receive the link to our Discord server. For the sake of this book club, I've broken down The Fall of Numenor into 10 sections, and today we will be covering the third section. This video contains my notes from this section, as well as any important comments that were brought up during our live voice chat this past Sunday evening. So let's dive in. Chapter 3. Sauron begins to stir. This section is covering pages 43 through 65. From many dwarves leaving their old cities in Arid Luin go to Moria and swell its numbers, all the way through a region founded by the Noldor. So we've got about 700 years of history to cover in this video, so let's get going. Year 40. Many dwarves leaving their old cities in Arid Luin go to Moria and swell its numbers. The title for this section is pretty self-explanatory, but it's also in this section that we get to learn a little bit about Durin the Deathless. He is the eldest of the seven fathers of the dwarves, and the ancestor of all the kings of the Longbeards. He lived so long that he was called Durin the Deathless, though obviously he died and this happened before the Elder Days had passed. His lineage, however, never ended, and five times an heir received the name of Durin. Now, these heirs weren't all born in successive order, but rather they were given the name of Durin after they exhibited traits reminiscent of the original Durin. In this time, he came to the region that became Khazad Dum, which is also called Moria. And at the end of the First Age, Khazad Dum was thriving after Nagrod and Belagost had been ruined. Year 442 The Death of Elros Tarminutor. The first king of Numenor was Elros Tarminutar, who ruled for 410 years and lived 500 years total. He had been given the longest lifespan of any man, and though his descendants didn't live as long as he did, they still lived much longer than any of the Numenorians. Elros had four children, Vardamir Noliman, which means learned one, Manwendil, Atanokar, and a daughter named Tindomio. The second king of Numenor was Tar of Ardemir, uh, Elros's first son. However, he chose not to rule, instead immediately passing the scepter to his son. However, he is nonetheless counted the second king of Numenor, and he is deemed to have reigned one year. After his time, it became the custom for the kings to pass the scepter of their own free will before their death, and this continued until the latter years of Numenor. Tar of Ardemir had four children, Amandil, Vardilme, Aulendil, and Nolendil. The third king of Numenor was Tar Amandil, who ruled from 442 to 590. His name, Amandil, means friend or lover of Amman, and he had three children, Elendil, Eärendur, and Myron. Circa year 500, Sauron begins to stir again in Middle-earth. At the beginning of this section, we get to learn a little bit more about Sauron in the beginning. In the beginning of Arda, Melkor had seduced Sauron, who was also called Gorthaur, and he became the greatest servant of the enemy. Sauron could assume many forms and could appear noble and beautiful. Tolkien writes, Get the lies that Melkor, the mighty and accursed, Morgoth Bauglir, the power of terror and hate, sowed in the hearts of elves and men, are a seed that does not die and cannot be destroyed. And ever and anon it sprouts anew, and will bear dark fruit even until the latest days. Those new sprouting lies and hatreds were tended and nurtured by Sauron. Sauron in the beginning of the Second Age After the fall of Morgoth, Sauron put on his fair hue again, and he repented before Aeonwe. Sauron was commanded by Aeonwe to return to Amon to receive judgment, but ultimately he refused and hid himself in Middle-earth, where he eventually turned back to evil. 
Tolkien writes, therefore, when Aeonwe departed, he hid himself in Middle Earth, and he fell back into evil, for the bonds that Morgoth had laid upon his were very strong. It's in this section that we get to learn a little bit more about Sauron's motivations, starting with two different quotes from some of Tolkien's letters. In letter 153, Tolkien explains that Sauron was not evil in his origin, and that his temporary turn to good and benevolence ended in a greater relapse until he became the main representative of evil of later ages. In letter 131, Tolkien writes that Sauron lingers in Middle-earth, very slowly, beginning with fair motives, the reorganizing and rehabilitation of the ruin of Middle-earth, which he feels had been neglected by the gods. He becomes a reincarnation of evil. Tolkien writes, It had been his virtue, and therefore also the cause of his fall, and of his relapse, that he loved order and coordination. He also writes, His plans, the idea coming from his own isolated mind, became the sole object of his will, and an end, the end, in itself. It's also in this section that Tolkien makes a curious claim. Was Sauron greater than Morgoth? He writes, Sauron was greater, effectively, in the Second Age than Morgoth at the end of the First. Why? Because though he was far smaller by natural stature, he had not yet fallen so low. Now Morgoth had let most of his being pass into the physical constituents of the earth as he sought to dominate it, and Sauron only did so with the rings, because he had wanted to dominate the creatures of the earth in their wills and minds. Tolkien writes, Sauron, however, inherited the corruption of Arda, and only spent his much more limited power on the rings. For it was the creatures of the earth, in their minds and wills, that he desired to dominate. In this way, Sauron was also wiser than Melkor Morgoth. Sauron was not a beginner of discord, and he probably knew more of the music, which is the music of the Ainur, than did Melkor, whose mind had always been filled with his own plans and devices. So in this quote, we can see that Sauron benefited from the foundations laid by Morgoth, and he was able to pick up where he had left off without having to devote much of his own power towards this end. Sauron also did not want to destroy the world, as Morgoth did, but rather to rule it. Tolkien writes, he did not object to the existence of the world, so long as he could do what he liked with it. Sauron also felt that the Valar had forgotten Middle-earth, which swelled his pride. And I think it's in this section that we can see that Sauron is a, a much more calculated and subtle villain compared to Morgoth, and this was really fun to discuss in our um, chat this week. We'll have a little bit more about Sauron at the end of this video when we get to our discussion notes. Year 521, Birth in Numenor of Silmarion. The fourth king of Numenor was Tar Elendil, which means star lover or elf friend and he was also called Parmaite, which means book-handed. The children of Tar Elendil were Silmarion, Isilme, and Meneldur. Now Meneldur would become the next king, due to the laws of the time which did not allow a female descendant to take the scepter. And it is in Tar Elendil's reign that the Numenorians first journeyed to Middle-earth. Silmarion is an important character to take note of in this section because the son of Silmarion was a Valandil, from whom came the lords of Andunie. Tolkien writes, Of Valandil came the lords of Andunie, of whom the last was Amandil, father of Elendil the Tall, who came to Middle-earth after the downfall. Year 600, the first ships of the Numenorians appear off the coasts. Shipbuilding and sea craft were prioritized over any other arts, and the Numenorians became great mariners. Now, we've already spoken of the Ban of the Valar in a previous section, but it's laid out a little bit more detailed in this section. Manwe allowed the Numenorians to sail, but never so far west that they could not see the coast of Numenor. In these days, Valinor still remained within the world. Avalone, though not within Amon, could still be seen from Numenor, and he did not want the Numenorians to be tempted to travel all the way to Amon. Tolkien writes, but the design of Manwe was that the Numenorians should not be tempted to seek the blessed realm, nor desire to overpass the limits set to their bliss, becoming enamored with the immortality of the Valar and the Eldar, and the lands where all things endure. Due to the ban, the Numenorians sailed ever eastwards, and it's also fun to note in this section that at the time of 
all of this, the world is still flat. So it is in this time that the Numenorians first came to Middle-earth. Veontur, captain of king's ships under Tar Elendil, first came to Mithlond, the Grey Havens. Upon his first visit, they were welcomed by Gilgalad, and they became friends and allies. Now the men of Eriador were filled with wonder because they had believed all of the men beyond the western mountains had drowned when Beleriand was destroyed, and so they sent emissaries to meet the Numenorians. Tolkien writes, Thus it came about that there was a meeting between them on the Tower Hills, and to that meeting with the Numenorians came twelve men only out of Eriador, men of high heart and courage, for most of their people feared that the newcomers were perilous spirits of the dead. The Numenorians pitied the men of Middle-earth, and initially came as teachers and helpers and givers of gifts. They gave gifts such as corn and wine, and they also taught knowledge of their language, of sowing seed, grinding grain, hewing wood, shaping stone, and and all in all, ordering their lives towards bliss. Tolkien writes, In this time, the men shook off the yoke of the offspring of Morgoth and unlearned their terror of the dark. And it's also during this time that Sauron remained hidden, hating the Eldar and fearing the Numenorians. The Voyages of Aldarion Menaldur, son of Tar Elendil, married Almarion, daughter of Veantur. Their son was named Anardil, which means lover of the sun, but he would later be called Aldarion. Aldarion, which means son of the trees, was fair and proud. He was a tree steward and forester, and he loved the sea and shipbuilding. In year 725, for his 25th birthday, his grandfather suggested that they sail to Middle-earth together. His father was wary for him to go, but allowed him to go nonetheless. However, he warned him not to become enamored of the great lands, for he must one day be king and father of this isle. His first journey lasted two years, and on this journey he met Círdan and Gilgalad, and he journeyed far in Linden and the west of Eriador. Unfortunately, when Aldarion returned, his eyes were brighter, but they looked far away, and unfortunately he had become enamored of the sea. Three years after his return, Aldarion went back to Linden, and he did not return for three years. The voyage after that lasted four years, so he's getting in the habit of being gone quite often. In year 740, Tar Meneldur became the fifth king of Numenor. This happened when Aldarion was 40 years old. Meneldur was a gentle and kind man without pride, who dearly loved Numenor. However, he was uninterested in the sea, and he preferred to watch the stars. He built a tall tower from which to study the stars in this time. Year 750, a region founded by the Noldor. Around approximately the year 700, a region, which is later called Hallin, was founded by Celeborn and Galadriel, and it was populated primarily by Noldoran elves. Now, in the previous section, Tolkien wrote that Celebrimbor was the founder of a region, and here we have Celeborn and Galadriel founding it. So this is an example of two differing narratives. However, I think in the end, it's not that important, and we can say that the Noldor founded Eregion, and all three of them were there, so it doesn't really matter that much. Elves and Dwarves Galadriel may have chosen this area to be close to Moria. Galadriel was sympathetic towards the dwarves as one of the Noldor, for the dwarves are the children of Aule, and Galadriel had been a pupil of Aule and Yavanna in Valinor. Now, Celeborn, on the other hand, did not like dwarves due to their participation in the ruin of Doriath, even though these dwarves, specifically of Moria, had not directly been involved. Galadriel perceived that Middle-earth could not be saved without a union of all peoples who opposed the evil left behind by Morgoth. Tolkien writes, Galadriel became aware that Sauron again, as in the ancient days of the captivity of Melkor, had been left behind. In this time, Sauron wasn't operating with a single name, but Galadriel perceived that there was an evil controlling purpose abroad in the world. Also in Eregion dwelt Celebrimbor as their chief artificer, and his best friend was one of the dwarves named Narvi. The chief city of Eregion was called Ost in Ethel, which means Fortress of the Eldar, and in this time 
The Gwaith y Miradine, the people of the jewelsmiths, was founded by Celebrimbor. There's also a cool reference to the Fellowship of the Ring in this section where we learn about the doors of Durin as described by the Fellowship. And these were made in collaboration between Celebrimbor and Narvi. And there's also a neat note about Mithril in the end of this section. So all of that brings us to a close in the notes section. And now let's talk about our discussion. We had a really fun chat last Sunday about this section and a lot of fun topics came up. So I'm just going to go through each of them, um, bringing up important points that I think are worth mentioning. Death in Numenor. What did it mean for the Numenorians to give up their lives of their own free will? Numenorians had a greater control over their own body and their own lives. And because of this, they had the ability to choose when they could let themselves go into death rather than clinging to it. In the earlier days of Numenor, until the end, the kings of Numenor would surrender the scepter to the heir before they reached the end of their life, and this allowed for a much more peaceful transition of power, and it was also an act of humility on the king's part. Tarvardamir, why didn't Tarvardamir want the scepter? By the time Elros passed the scepter to him, Vardamir was almost 400 years old, even for a Numenorian that was quite old. So instead of ascending the throne, he immediately passed the scepter to his eldest son, Amandil, who would rule instead. Life in Middle-earth The men of Middle-earth had not been living very well when they met the Numenorians, and they benefited from them a lot at first, and this makes the events of the latter years even more saddening. Something that was asked in our discussion is why didn't the elves help out the men of Middle-earth? Because you can see that the elves are there, but they don't really seem to mind that the men are living in conditions that aren't very nice. I want to start out by saying that the elves aren't perfect. If you've only read The Lord of the Rings and not The Silmarillion, you might have a rosier view of the elves, but really they are pretty consistently misbehaving all throughout The Silmarillion and they're not perfect, so they can make bad choices. So it might have been the right choice for them to help out the men, and they chose not to. But I do think this is in part because successors of these men helped out with Morgoth, either directly or indirectly. If they would have been the quote-unquote good guys, they would have been in Numenor by now. So the men that are left behind are kind of the ones who didn't really pick the right side of things uh, at the time and the elves are not quick to forgive or forget. The elves were also obsessed with embalming and preserving themselves, so maybe they just didn't feel like they had time to help out. The Seeds of Morgoth. What does it mean that Morgoth planted seeds for Sauron to then nurture? It's important to remember that Morgoth, aka Melkor, was a part of the creation of the world, and so the earth has been permanently stained by his discord and his interference in the music of the Ainur. He also pit the children of Iluvatar against each other, and he sowed distrust, which lasted generations. It says in The Lord of the Rings that treason and betrayal are woven in the history of Middle-earth, especially between races, especially between elves and dwarves and elves and men. And so you can see that even though Morgoth is out of the picture, the damage that he started is is lasting um, as long as the earth will last. However, it's also important to remember that Eru allows free will and yet also moves the results of free will according to his continually unfolding plan, even when it comes to Melkor. So not even Melkor is able to escape the will of Iluvatar. There's a really great quote from the Silmarillion about this. Tolkien writes, And thou, Melkor, shalt see that no theme may be played that hath not its uttermost source in me, nor can any alter the music in my despite. For he that attempteth this shall prove but mine instrument in the devising of things more wonderful, which he himself hath not imagined. This principle can be seen most clearly during the creation of the world, in which Melkor pours forth heats unrestrained and bitter cold, but it's through his actions that comes the creation of clouds, rain, snow, and things such as that, which are objectively good. And so we can see that even Melkor, no matter how much he ruins things, messes things up, he's not able to escape the will of Iluvatar. Uh, 
Another thing that was brought up in our discussion was the similarities between Sauron and the Noldor. One of our members, Bramling, said, One thing that stood out to me was the potentially somewhat repentant Sauron being unwilling to return in humiliation and to receive from the Valar a sentence, which to me feels very much parallel to the feelings of the Noldor who chose to remain behind in Middle-earth because they didn't want to be at the bottom of the pecking order in Valinor. So I'm not sure if Tolkien intended for this similarity, but I thought it was very interesting, especially considering that Sauron was once a Maya of Aule and that many of the Noldor, and that the Noldor are favored by Aule as well, and a lot of them were his pupils. What might Sauron's consequences have been if he would have returned to Valinor? Tolkien writes, Then Sauron was ashamed, and he was unwilling to return in humiliation, and to receive from the Valar a sentence, it might be, of long servitude in proof of his good faith, for under Morgoth his power had been great. This caused me to look up a little bit about Asse, because we know that from the Silmarillion, Asse is one of the Maiar who had turned to Melkor's side in the beginning, but he was ultimately swayed back to the side of the Valar. Tolkien writes in the Silmarillion, Melkor hated the sea, for he could not subdue it. It is said that in the making of Arda, he endeavored to draw Asse into his allegiance, promising him all the realm and power of Olmo if he would serve him. So it was that long ago there arose great tumults in the sea that wrought ruin to the lands. But Uinen, at the prayer of Aule, restrained Asse and brought him before Olmo, and he was pardoned and returned to his allegiance, to which he has remained faithful. So I thought this was an interesting parallel, especially when we think back about which of the Maiar raised Numenor from the sea, it was Asse, and which of the Maiar is ultimately going to return Numenor to the sea, Um, it's going to be Sauron. So there's a really interesting parallel between these two Maiar. However, it seems to be the case there isn't really a lot about if Asse faced any consequences for this, but I would say that Sauron's service to Melkor or Morgoth had been much longer and much more destructive. So it's difficult to say um, if it would have been similar, if he would have just been pardoned right away, or if he would have indeed had um, a long amount of service in order to prove his allegiance, and he was unwilling to do that. We also discussed the hopelessness that can come from feeling beyond redemption. When it comes to Sauron, it's almost as if he feels he's unable to be redeemed, and it reminded me a lot of the sons of Feanor. At the end of the Silmarillion, Mithros and Maglor consider whether or not they should return to Amon to ask to be pardoned. Tolkien writes, But Mithros answered that if they returned to Amon, but the favor of the Valar were withheld from them, then their oath would still remain, but its fulfillment be beyond all hope. And he said, Who can tell to what dreadful doom we shall come if we disobey the powers in their own land, or purpose ever to bring war again in their holy realm? Yet Maglor still held back, saying, If Manwe and Varda themselves deny the fulfillment of an oath to which we named them in witness, is it not made void? And Mithros answered, But how shall our voices reach to Iluvatar beyond the circles of the world? And by Iluvatar we swore in our madness and called the everlasting darkness upon us if we kept not our word. Who shall release us? If none can release us, said Maglor, then indeed the everlasting darkness shall be our lot, whether we keep our oath or break it. But less evil shall we do in the breaking. Yet he yielded at last to the will of Mithros, and they took counsel together how they should lay hands on the Silmarils. And we know, if you've read the Silmarillion, what happens to them in the end, especially in Mithros. So you can kind of see the results of feeling an utter sense of hopelessness and feeling like you're unable to be redeemed. So it's just kind of a sad thought um, when it comes to these characters. We also discussed the fact that the Valar have limits. They are not all-powerful, which is unfortunate for the good guys, but um, it's great that Melkor had a limit to his power. So with that, I think we can wrap up. This has been quite a long video, and we are very excited to begin our next part, part four, which is Aldarion and Arendis, pages 66 through 82. Now I will link the different resources mentioned in our chat in the description, And I would also like to thank our patrons who make these free resources possible. If you would like to support Tea with Tolkien by becoming a patron, you can learn more at patreon.com slash teawithtolkien. 
thank you so much for hanging out and for participating in our Discord and our book club. I really hope that this has been a helpful resource to you. I've really enjoyed leading this book club and especially getting to hear everyone's thoughts during our voice chats. So thank you so much. And I will talk to you all soon. Thank you.